sure is good to see everybody today. Are we ever going to get our summer? Is it ever going to get here? <laughs> Sunshine in my soul today, just not outside. You know, every time I get up here, I'm distracted by the good thoughts that people bring while we're in preparation for the Lord's Supper and just in worship. The thoughts that Michael brought this morning about hope, it is so essential that we have hope. I know I've told the story of hope in the, in the form of the perfectly good dead horse. But there's some of you that haven't heard about the perfectly good dead horse. So I'm going to tell that story. When I moved to Washington for my first full-time preaching job, Bubba was a about three years old, and we had some horses, and my neighbor had some horses, and one of my neighbors had a real nice horse, <laughs> a real expensive horse. And during a, a flood in the spring, we had, uh, we lived right next to a, um, it was a bird sanctuary. It was a lot of wetlands and uh, a lot of places where there was just, when it really got wet, it got real muddy. And this expensive horse of his got, got out, got away, ran off. <laughs> and so after the flood stopped, after the rain stopped, we went out looking for this expensive horse. We looked for several days, off and on, and finally we found it. We found it. And it was perfectly fine, except it was dead. There was nothing wrong with it, except it was dead. It had gotten bogged in the mire up to his, uh, up to his belly. And that horse struggled in that mud and struggled and struggled. And then with nothing wrong with it, it just died. Just gave up the ghost. That is the most perfect example to me of what happens when any living thing loses hope. It's a horrible thing to lose hope. So I understand, I understand why Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 1, writing to every church everywhere, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know three things. So that you may know what is the hope of his calling. That's the first thing. What? Hope do we have in this life? And that really fits well with what I want to talk about. But there. Some things cannot be stolen from us. You know, they can steal your money. I had a I had a beautiful gun. <laughs> Carried it with me everywhere in my truck, hidden in my truck, until somebody broke the window and stole my gun. Because they can steal your gun. They can steal your money. Some handsome silver-tongued devil can steal your girl. I mean, those things happen. Things can be stolen. Huh? <laughs> and not mine, but some people's girl can be stolen by that silver tongue devil. There are a lot of things that can be stolen. 
And Paul warns about if you're a thief and tells you how to stop being a thief because that's a serious problem in this world. But there are some things that can't be stolen. And when you look at the things that can't be, I, I had John read this from Romans because I want us to know that the love of God cannot be stolen from us. It can't be taken. Nobody can get it. We have to surrender that. We have to give it up. You know, there's a... I, I, I have to talk uh, just a minute about religion. Are you a religious person? Uh, do you... Do you think of yourself as a religious person? You know, there, there are ways that I hope not. I hope that you are not religious. I hope that you're just a believer in Jesus. When Paul in chapter 17 of Acts was talking to these people who were all pagans, he had, he had marched up this long, windy hill in Athens to, to Mars Hill, this long, windy path. And at every turn of the path, there was a different God, a God to the farms and a God to the sheep and a God to the, to the sea and a God to the... I mean, everything you could think of, there was a God to it. And even this one, this to an unknown God in case they forgot one. When Paul spoke to them in one of the trans I think it's the King James. It says, I, men of Athens, I perceive that you are very religious. You're very, what is that word? What does that mean? It takes on a very bad connotation, and I don't like to be thought of as religious because it has as its root this ritualistic, Adherence to a, and I, I don't want to be ritualistic in my adherence to my faith in the Lord. I want, I want to do what I do based on my firm belief that he is and my hope that he's going to do what he told me he's going to do. I don't want it to be by rote. I don't want to repeat prayers by number or, or by beads or, or by any other way. I don't want to be known as a religious person. You know, there were two brothers. They formed one of the churches that we have as a denomination in the world today that did everything that they did by method. By method, they arose at a certain time. They prayed at a certain time. They had uh, times when they would reflect, meditation, times for this, times for that. And you don't deviate from the times. The times became the important factor. And the truth of the matter is, is that some of those groups no longer even adhere to the words of the New Testament. So the rituals, the rituals might change a little bit from year to year. They might change because they're not based on the same principles that they once were. There are some things that never change. That is, our need to understand the hope that we have in the promises that Jesus has made. Let me read this again from Romans. Who is the one who condemns? Who are you worried about? Who are you worried about condemning you? Do you do what you do because of who might see or what someone might think? I would ask you to go back and to look at the life of the Lord Jesus. There were several examples. Michael used a couple of real good ones. Do you suppose that the Lord Jesus was concerned about what those Pharisees thought when they brought this woman before them? Now, there are a number of problems with what happened there. 
They're trying to trap our Lord, who was the maker of all of these laws. They're trying to trap him with his own laws. Of course, they don't recognize that he is the maker of those laws. But they bring a woman and accuse her of adultery. But how many does it take to commit adultery? Two. I mean, it's kind of hard to commit adultery just one person. So the first thing that the Lord sees in this hypocrisy is, hey, you're only bringing her. Where's the guy? And where is the honor in what you're doing right here? Honor and rectitude, righteousness, justice, fairness, all of those things that we talked about when we read from Ezekiel this morning that were expected for a man to be righteous. What we have is not a bunch of laws that we have to fear and that we have to rigidly pay attention to. We do them because we want to be God's people. We want to do it because of what he's already done for us. It's a matter of gratitude. It's not a matter of living up to that law. It's a matter of trying to find favor in the eyes of the Lord because you, that statement that you made about David, he was a man after God's own heart. I know we've talked about this before, but understand what that means. That doesn't mean that he was like God. It doesn't mean that his heart was exactly like God's heart. It means that he was after, he was searching, he was trying to get God's heart. He wanted God to love him. Folks, Bad as I am at times. That's exactly what I'm after. I want my Lord to be proud of me. And I know one thing for certain. No one can take my honor from me. I have to surrender my honor. I have to surrender my righteousness. Every time I'm faced with a decision, I either do what I know will be pleasing to my Lord out of gratitude, or I fail to test in that particular. I, I am so grateful that He has made allowances for my mistakes. So, who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus. Is He who died? You notice it doesn't even answer that directly. It says, yes, rather was who was raised. He died and he was raised. And then it goes on to say, who is at the right hand of God. And there he intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Here's the question. He died, he rose, and he's seated right next to God. And there he has one job that's on his mind. And that is covering my mistakes. Covering your mistakes. What he wants from us is loyalty. What he wants from us is gratitude. What he wants from us is our love for each other so that what he's done for us spreads to all men. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation? How much can they do to me that will separate me from the love that caused him to die for me in the first place? I mean, it was that kind of tribulation that brought about my salvation. Distress? What about persecutions? You know, one of the things that I worry about is that we pray for peace and we pray for tranquility 
And we pray for prosperity. When you stop and think about it, maybe that's the worst thing in the world for us. Because prosperity brings about laziness. Prosperity brings about an attitude of everything's good. Why worry? I think the times of biggest growth in the Lord's church has been when it has been the hardest to do it. In the New Testament first century times, when the church was being spread all over the world because they were chasing them, trying to kill them because of what they believed, you find that every time they went to a new place, the church just blew up. It just just grew like crazy because everybody knew the price, first of all, that Jesus had paid and the price that they may be called upon to pay, but it wasn't without hope. Because they understood that regardless of what happens, it doesn't matter whether it's uh, tribulation or distress or persecution. It doesn't matter whether it's famine. Our honor, our loyalty, our sense of gratitude for what he has done will carry us through those times. Because what is the absolute absolute worst that can happen rescue (laughs) and unless you understand the hope that there is in his calling you will never understand the beauty of what Christ Jesus offers us he says will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness what, what has not having any clothing, if they strip you naked and tie you to a post in the town square, how does that separate you from the love that God has for you? Now you might think to yourself, my God or a a loving God would never let that happen. You ever thought about your job? Your job in all of this? I want to go back and I want to look at a case or two. I want us to go back to Job, the second chapter, because there's a there's a little point that I want to get from this. As Job comes onto the scene, I sure wish I knew more about Job. I wish I knew who he was and when he was exactly and you know a little more background on it, but we don't need that. So said, there was a man in the land of Uz. Uz. Huh. Well, I know when it was. <laughs> Actually, it's not too terribly far, <laughs> but there's a big old Arabian desert in between. But the point is, I do know that this is prior to Abraham, I think. <laughs> because this, the place called Uz was later named Bethel by Jacob. So I, I know this is probably before Jacob, maybe before Abraham says, uh, this man was blameless and upright, fearing God and turning away from evil. This is a man of honor right here. He had all kinds of things. He had all kinds of things. It says in verse 6 of chapter 1, That was the day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. You think evil's not in heaven? (laughs) Well, check this out. The Lord said to Satan, where do you come from? Satan said to the Lord, from roaming around about on the earth and walking around on it, the Lord said to Satan, Here's a, this is almost like a challenge. Have you considered my servant Job? 
There is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. So Satan takes the challenge. He says, yeah, right, right, right. And, and he's that way because you give him everything he wants and you protect him on every side. You reach out and touch him and he'll, he'll curse you. Well, the Lord lets him do it. And the reason is, is because you and I need somebody to show us. Show us. Show us what? This happened twice. And each time it got more and more drastic. The last time the devil touched him, his whole body, and he was covered with sores and like boils. I don't know if you've ever had a boil or not, but I, <laughs> that's the worst thing in the world. I've never been plagued with acne, but I had a boil right there on my eyebrow. Worst place in the world for a teenage kid to have a boil on his eyebrow. Anyway, this man is so plagued with these things, they're on the soles of his feet to the top of his head, so bad that in verse uh, 9, after all this happens, he's sitting in a pile of ashes, and he's scraping these things with a potsherd. In case you don't know what a potsherd is, it's a piece of pottery, broken pottery. He's so devastated that he's sitting in a pile of ashes, scraping these things with a piece of broken pottery. His wife comes up to him in verse 9. Now, this is a good woman here. His wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Are you still going to be a man of honor? Why don't you curse God and die? Uh, who's she worried about here? Is she tired of taking care of him? Or is this just her being fed up with life in general because of what she's lost as well? Do you still hold fast to your integrity, to your honor? Huh. When you read on down, it tells us in all this, Job did not give up his integrity. He held fast to his integrity. Didn't matter what. Nothing else mattered to Job Folks, I got, I got to tell you that when we do what's right, when we are right in God's sight, when we return with gratitude the things that God has done for us and the salvation of our souls, the cleansing us of our sins, it doesn't matter what anybody else does. It doesn't matter what they do to us. It doesn't matter what they take from us. They can take anything they want to take, but they will never take the love that we read about back here. Because God has the ability to make all things right no matter when, no matter what. I look at this story of Job, and I think about today and the, the problems that we have in this world. And I, I, I see... We're living in a society that becomes less and less aware of what sin actually is. We, do you remember what Isaiah said in, I think it's chapter 55 of Isaiah, where he says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. When it gets to the point where you... You can't do the right things because people are going to call you the troubler of Israel or they're going to call you a bigot or they're going to make some kind of disparaging, take some kind of disparaging action against you. Well, folks, that's what he's talking about here when he talks about tribulation. That's what it's talking about in the book of Revelation when it talks about the mark of the beast and you're not going to be able to eat or to drink or to get a job or to do anything without the mark of the beast. 
And everybody's looking for this 666 to be stamped on people's foreheads. Maybe it's barcodes or, I mean, <laughs> I, I hear all of these, uh, these ideas about what all that is. When in reality, it's the opposite of what Moses was talking about. Or what was, the Lord was talking about to Moses when he talked to him in, in Deuteronomy chapter 11. In verse 18. Here's what he writes, or what he told Moses. You shall therefore impress these words of mine. This is the law of Moses, everything that they had been given by God. Impress these words of mine on your heart. You know how you impress something? Well, when I, I have this thing about having tight sheets. What's that got to do with anything? Well, I don't like sheets wadding up under me because I wake up in the morning with impressions all over my body because the sheets are wadded up and I have these marks all over my person. It bothers me to death. So (laughs) I have this, I think, ingenious method. I have these... uh, tarp clamps and I fasten them to my sheet and I run paracord underneath the mattress and I cinch it up and my sheet goes (laughs) keeps them tight now why was I saying that (laughs) I lost my point (laughs) verse 18 impress these words of mine On your heart. That is, make an impression. You ever ever heard about making an impression? And how hard it is to correct a first impression? You can only make one first impression. Moses wants these people to learn God's word, have it impressed on their hearts. He says, and on your soul. You know what your soul is? Your soul is what you do with the spirit that God puts in your body. It's the combination of body and spirit that produces the soul. It's the outcome of those two things. It's what you do with it. Do you do with it with honor? He says, impress these words of mine. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your foreheads. Now, if you have something that is a sign on your head, your forehead, and a sign on your hand, what does that mean? Does that mean what the Jews thought it meant? That they put these little, uh, they would hang these little um, scrolls on the sleeve of their garment little little biblical scrolls that contain these passages right here they would hang them there so that everywhere they went it would dangle and the scriptures would touch them on the forehead and on the hand you know they had this little box that hung up there too now that's bright is that what he's talking about Is that what he's trying to get them to do? Hang little scrolls there? He's talking about affecting the way you think and affecting the things that you do. When you oppress it on your forehead, impress it on your forehead, or it touches your forehead, it affects your thinking. When it touches your hand, it affects what you do. And it's the same thing with the mark of the beast. It's the same two places in Revelation. It's the forehead and the hand. How can you tell when a person is affected by the thinking of the devil? Watch how they think and what they do. It's the same thing, only opposite. So what Moses is trying to get them to understand is that we need to prepare our minds, which then affects our actions. You shall teach them to your sons, talking of them 
when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you rise up, this is every minute of the day. I know <laughs> this story probably gets old, but I, I remember that, that commercial of the man walking down the, this path. And I know exactly where the path is that was in that, in that commercial. It was an anti-smoking commercial. And it was made just north or just east of Sacramento along a canal there with a, with a, a road that went along it with eucalyptus trees all along the side. I know exactly where they made that because I've been there. And this man's walking down, and, and he's, he picks up a stone, and his little boy's with him, and he skips that stone out across the water, and it, little guy picks up a rock, and poof, <laughs> it just goes straight into the water. And they do it again, and then, then the man stops, and he puts his foot up on a log, and stands there looking out over the water, and little boy throws his leg up on the log and that hit home really because I was walking someplace on our property one day and Bubba and John were both with me and <laughs> I, I stopped and I put my, my foot up on a, a pile of logs and Bubba was about four and he did the same thing, only it was really high for him, so he stuck it way up there like this. It was really uncomfortable. It was really comfortable for me, but uncomfortable for Bubba. And, and then John, little guy was about a year old, <laughs> and he kept throwing his leg up there, but he couldn't get it up high enough to get it on the log. He wanted to be just like, just like his older brother and just like his dad. The commercial went on. The boy and the dad kept, the boy kept repeating what the dad did. And they sat down next to the canal and the dad lit up. And the end of the commercial was a little boy looking at dad. And you, you knew what was coming next, you know. He says, you shall teach them to your sons, not just your sons, your children. Talking of them when you sit in your house. When there's an opportunity, when you see an attitude that's out of adjustment, when you see something that needs to be corrected, when you see anything that needs to be taught, take the opportunity to do it, right then? When you sit in your house, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, time to talk. Talk and tell what needs to be told. Impress these words of his on your heart and on your soul. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Everywhere we look or do, we should think of God's word. And how we can live up to and show our gratitude for the things that he's done for us. And remember one thing. That nobody can take our honor or our loyalty away from us. We have to voluntarily yield that. If you know what you need to do in your life to make your life right before God, restore your honor. You know, honor is not something that you lose forever. David, David lost his honor. And then got it back. Abraham? Oh, oh, wow. I was reading this morning about Abraham and Pharaoh. He goes to Egypt and he wants to find favor in Pharaoh's sight. So he tells Sarah to say, you're my sister. And knowing that she's going to be taken into Pharaoh's palace... That's not right. And then later on, he does the same thing with Abimelech. Both of those times, both of those times are sandwiched on both sides of Abraham having such honor when it comes to going after his 
nephew Lot, defeating four kings with 318 men because he had no fear. Doesn't make sense that he gave up his honor. God gave it back to him. He showed his honor. God let him be an example of all men. He lost his honor again and then found it back. One deed, a series of deeds, is not a life. Keep your honor. I worry about the world that we live in and its effects on God's people. We need to recognize that we don't live by the current thoughts of right and wrong. We have an unchanging standard of right and wrong that needs to be our our example. If you're subject this morning to the gospel, call in any way. Please make your life right with God today. Won't you come while we stand and sing the song that Ron has for us?